happened. It highlighted North Korea, Syria, Iran and Libya as dangerous regimes and said that their existence justified the creation of a worldwide command and control system, World Army. This guy, David Frum, was the man who wrote the speech when Bush talked about the axis of evil, which was North Korea, Iraq and Iran straight off the pages of the project for the new American century. It spotlighted China for regime change eventually, saying it's time for a presence of American forces in Southeast Asia. This could lead to American and allied power providing the spur to the process of democratization in China. It called for the creation of US space forces to dominate space and total control of cyberspace to prevent the enemies, their enemies using the internet. Now we're seeing the internet being targeted more and more to stop the free flow of information. It talked of developing biological weapons that can target specific genotypes. And this may transform biological warfare from the realm of terror to a politically useful tool. This is the mentality behind the people behind the war on terror. And then it said this, for this agenda, this process of transformation, as it called it, to happen in a reasonably short time, there had to be some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. This was in September 2000. This process of transformation is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. One year to the month after that document was published, and nine months after the people behind it came to power with Bush, America had what Bush called at the time our Pearl Harbor, 9-11. As a result of that, I go into that in detail in this book which I wrote some time ago. As a result of that, 9-11 horror, the great list of things in that document have been justified into place by that event. This is the guy, the United Nations ambassador at the time, who was pressing the case to invade Afghanistan and all the rest of it. This is the people behind this. John Pilger in the New Statesman said of this guy, John Negroponte, how appropriate that John Negroponte is Bush's ambassador at the United Nations. This week he delivered America's threat to the world that it may require to attack more and more countries. As U.S. ambassador to Honduras in the early 1980s, Negroponte oversaw American funding of the regime's death squads, known as Battalion 316, that wiped out the democratic opposition while the CIA ran its contra war of terror against neighboring Nicaragua. Murdering teachers and slitting the throats of midwives were a speciality. These are the people that launched the war on terror. He later became head of U.S. operations in Iraq and head of U.S. intelligence. Because there is the movie, Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and there's the secret agenda doing what we need to justify the agenda. After 9-11 we had uh, Bush saying we must get Bin Laden but that's the last thing they wanted. This is a guy called Michael Springman US consulate in Jeddah Saudi Arabia at the time of Father George Bush. In Saudi Arabia I was repeatedly ordered by high-level State Department officials to issue visas to unqualified applicants. These were essentially people who had no ties either to Saudi Arabia or to their own country. I complained bitterly at the time there. I returned to the US, I, claim, I complained to the State Department here, to the General Accounting Office, to the Bureau of Diplomatic Security, and to the Inspector General's Office. I was met with silence. What I was protesting was, in reality, an effort to bring recruits rounded up by Osama bin Laden to the US for terrorist training by the CIA they would then be returned to Afghanistan to fight the then Soviets. Greg Palast, a real journalist, in his report on uh, Newsnight at the time, I received a phone call from a high-placed member of a US intelligence agency. He tells me that while there's been constraints on investigating Saudis under George Bush, it's gotten much worse. After the elections, 
the agencies were told to back off investigating the bin Ladens and Saudi royals and that angered agents. This was in the period before 9-11, in the months before 9-11. And Robin Cook, the former foreign secretary, who unfortunately died of a heart attack when he had lots of things to say on this, he said in a Guardian article just before he died, throughout the 80s, bin Laden was armed by the CIA and funded by the Saudis to wage jihad against the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda, literally the database, was originally the computer file of thousands of mujahideen who were recruited and trained with the help of the CIA to defeat the Russians. They created the problem and then offer the solution which is a war on terror that by its very nature is a war you can never say has ended. A war without end. And here we have Barack Obama the man behind him, his foreign policy advisor, Brzezinski, is the man who has publicly admitted that he um, orchestrated the uh, manipulation of the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union, which kicked the whole thing off. Whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, Labour or Conservative, the same force is running the show. The official story of 9-11 is a monstrosity. It is an insult to the intelligence. And what's interesting is that today, more and more people, particularly in America, in major academics and people like that at various universities, are some of the key people who are forensically taking apart the official story of 9-11, which, I have to say, is not difficult because it's so ludicrous. Not one strand fits to the other. This is a, a headscarf that was supposed to be in a plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, Flight 93. You know, not even dirty. Oh, but it's an exhibit. We found it. Hardly any wreckage, but we found that. And then there was the, uh, the passport, the hijacker's passport, which the FBI called a press conference to tell the world they had found near Ground Zero that had been in one of the planes that crashed. A long and dirty war, said Cheney, a war without end. A war without end in justifying the Orwellian state unfolding. See, because it's a mind game, it's not just a mind game, it's an emotional game. To a very large extent, problem, reaction, solution is manipulation of emotion. And the key emotion that entices people to give their power away more than any other is fear. People who are in fear of something give their power away to anyone they think will protect them from what they've been manipulated to fear. The more we can be persuaded to be frightened, the more likely we are to acquiesce to apparent solutions to that which we are frightened of. They need to put us into a, a mentality of fear and survival, fear of not surviving, fear of tomorrow, fear of meeting the check at the end of the month, paying the mortgage, meeting the rent, fear of whether you're going to lose your job, fear of the economy, fear of terrorism, fear of global warming, oh my God. We're being bombarded with reasons to fear because that is the key controlling force above all else. And we've got a choice, we've always got a choice, between acquiescing to that fear and in doing so, acquiescing to this Orwellian state,